So our last division, we don't have a lot of time to do it now, so let's get through it fast. We talked about the name of this division already. You don't pronounce the G, and it is from one of the very few scientific words that comes from a non-English language. It's from the, the Malay language, or the Malay Peninsula. Needham is the native name for one of these plants. There are three very weirdly different um, genera in this Nidophyta. So one that you would expect is Needham, the one that the division is named after. There is also Welwitchia. The name is Welwitchia mirabilis is the species, and that should clue you in that it's a very unusual plant, the strangest plant I think that there exists. And the last one, Ephedra. And you know that one maybe from all the hypes about herbal supplements for dieting that was a few years ago before they before they took them off the market because they're so dangerous. It has an analog of ephedrine, neurotransmitter ephedrine in it. And that's where the name ephedrine comes from, from ephedrine. <coughs> so these plants are really different from each other, Needham, Welwitchie, and ephedrine. In fact, when we saw them, you're gonna wonder why those belong together. And in fact, some people have suggested that they each belong in their own class. So maybe we're dealing not with just one class or one division here, but at least there are at least three different classes, perhaps, and maybe even three different divisions of the plants. This is uh, Needham, the most normal looking of those plants. These are the seeds. I'm just showing you this tiny to get you oriented a little bit here. So we've got a little cluster of seeds there. That would have been a cluster of, well, I don't want to say megasporophylls, but of female, a female strobilis. Here's the, some of the phylogenetic relationships. It seems like every time I look at the literature on this group, the phylogenetic relationships have changed. But we do know that the angiosperms and this group are very closely related to each other. Whether the Nidophyta is a monophyletic group, shown over here, or not a monophyletic group, shown on the right, keeps changing, keeps being <coughs> debated. But it is the closely related to the angiosperms. And that double fertilization we've talked about is one reason. Benetiales, this is an extinct group, which we're not going to study in this class. But one of the groups that's extinct that has been suggested is very closely related, again, to the flowering plants. Needham, again, this is a <coughs> male strobilis or a male cone. These plants are mostly dioecious. <coughs> throughout the division, but there are some monoecious. And we'll see an example of that in Needham in just a minute. Here's the female cone, or the strobilus of Needham. And you can't see here because they're so small, but there are very small bracts. Remember, bracts are just those leaf-like structures that are underneath or are involved in, a, in the reproductive zone. So there are bracts <coughs> under each of the ovules. Here is an ovule. So the structure of the strobilus in Needham is very simple. It's got a series of bracts And then on the axle of that bract, there's a little stem with an ovule in it, on it. And I make the branch of that stem a little longer than you would see it in the photograph, just to emphasize there that it's present. So they're born on branches. Okay, so there are no megasporophylls here. This is another case where we have the old mules born on branches. 
very short axes there. Another difference we have is if you look closely here, you'll see there's a little tip. See that little tip poking out there where the, there's the pollination droplet where that's coming out of? And if we draw that over here, we'll see here is that main part of the ovule. And sticking out of that, there is a little tip. There are two integuments in this case. This in the green is the inner integument. And in the red, we have the outer integument. So now we've got to go back and tell you that for everything else we've seen up until this point, all the conifers, they had a single integument. We didn't have to make a distinction because there was no distinction before. But now, in the neophyta and in the angiosperms, we're going to see in general two integuments. And there's going to be an inner and outer integument. I'll show you some picture of that in a minute. Wow, we are really over time. Here we see that, again, here in the black is the inner integument, and in the white now shaded with red is the outer integument. The rest of the parts of the ovule we'll look at in a minute if we have time. But right now I'm just emphasizing there are two integuments there. So the pollination droplet would form at the top. They're out of that inner integument. Here's Welwichia. Welwichia mirabilis. This grows in the um, driest places on Earth. It's a really hospitable, hospitable environment, isn't it, there? Um, in the Nambian Desert, this is just north of South Africa on the west coast of Africa. Very, very dry, almost no rain throughout the whole year. You can see there's no other vegetation except these really weird, strange <coughs> plants of Welwichia. Welwichia is very strange because it has only two leaves. These leaves, in fact, are the cotyledons So the whole leaves of the plant, all those big straggly leaves are two leaves. And these leaves have growth So there is intercalary leaf growth. In other words, the leaves are growing at the bottom. This is a meristem down here at the bottom. Of the no other plant on Earth has this. So these leaves are continually being produced from the bottom of these leaves, from that little mound of tissue. And it re results then in these things. So these are the cotyledons. You can't tell that there are two there, but they come up and then they've been torn to ribbons by the storms in the desert. This is a very famous plant there. It's got, this is alongside the road, and you can see it's fenced off there because this is where all the tourists stop to take pictures of these things. I actually know someone who went to Nambia just to see these plants grow out into the desert and took, didn't take that picture, but took pictures of that same plant. Okay. These are the cone axes. The um, female ovules have been shed already. From that, again, it's dioecious. Here are the, this is the female on this side and the male on this side. You can see that the axes are branched. We'll look at the structure here very briefly in a second. Again, this is the female cones. And here is the male. This is, a, this is our male cones. And now we need to look at the structure of the male cone so we can understand those diagrams. So here is the axis. This is the cone axis. There are bracts now along that axis. Let me draw the bracts here as little leaf-like things. In the axle of that bract, there is going to be a, 
um, microsporophore. So it's not a microsporophyll because it's not a leaf. It's a stem. And underneath that stem, change colors. Born on that axis, there is another set of two bracts, very small bracts, and I'm trying to draw them in here so you can see them. Two, and now they're called little bracts, bracteoles, I-O-L-E is the diminutive ending, so two bracteoles. So let's look now at these diagrams and figure out what we've got, how we see that structure. <coughs> Here is a bract. So that's the outer bract. Here's the sporophore. I'm just going to write sporophore because we're out of time. If we remove that bract, here is a brachial. Actually, no, that's not a brachial. I'm sorry, that's the sporophore again. The bracteoles aren't shown. So that's the sporophore. It's a leaf-like sporophore, but it is a branch. Even though it looks like a leaf. And we know it's a branch because it incurs in the axle of a bract. You can see that we have synangia in this case. So our microsporophores bear a synangia at the top. Here's Needham. And we're just going to have to end, I'm afraid. It's the most normal of looking of these things. We've seen the female already. And there it is again. I've drawn the picture for that already. And here is um, another species with the bracts, the ovules. This one is, this is what I was trying to get to. This is Monetius. So there's the ovule. And there are the microsporophores. Now the main genus that we're going to be dealing with in the Nidophyta is ephedra. And we haven't gotten to that in the lecture yet. We'll see it, of course, in lab. My lab has seen it already. So these first introductory things we've been saying about Wawichi and Needham are kind of to introduce you to this division, but it's not the main genera that we're going to, the main genus that we're going to be concerned with. We're concerned mainly with ephedra because we have material of that. We have actually very nice material that you can look at in the lab. So be sure to take a look at that. So we'll get to ephedra in just a minute. We ended up last time talking about these relatively poor pictures that I've got here. I have now seen that on the internet, there are really nice pictures. This stuff changes so fast on the internet. People have this year posted pictures that were not there last year. And I've got to come back and redo these <clears throat> lecture images because the stuff on the internet is really beautiful for these plants. So take a look at what you've got for um, Needham and Ephedra on the internet, especially Needham. This is Needham. They're really beautiful photographs that show the structures that I'm talking about much better than the photographs I've got here. Okay, so we can kind of see the ovules that the plant, the strobilus here is monoecious, and the microsporophores that are there. And then we have here the, a female cone with the seeds on it. And again, this is a needum, and this is before pollination, probably even before the ovules are completely mature in this case. And this really bad picture, I'm happy to get rid of this, but it does show the microsporophores kind of hanging out there are these compound stroboli, which have both sexes on them. Okay, here's ephedra. This is Mormon tea.
And <clears throat> it's a plant that grows in very dry areas. It grows in um, the Western United States, in Nevada, Utah, et cetera, high deserts uh, of, the, of the West. It, it also grows in other parts of the world. It's very drought adapted. You can see that the leaves are scale leaves. You don't even really see the leaves. This is a leaf down here, <coughs> that little thing down there. We'll have a better picture of it in a second, but it's hard to get a good picture because they're so tiny. So the photosynthesis is done by the stem. And we'll see that again in a, in a picture where we see green stems in just one second. The cones are born on the side in the axle of leaves, in the axles of scale leaves. And there are both male and female cones. So the plants in general are monoecious. So the male and female cones are on separate plants. And this one down here, this looks like a male cone. I'll have a better picture of a male cone in a second. Here's a female over here. You can see that little outer integuments coming up there. So it's called Mormon tea because it contains uh, ephedrine. Ephedrine is named after that. Ephedrine is a uh, analog of a neurotransmitter, epinephrine. And so when you drink this thing, you get a little bit of a buzz. And uh, that is why you shouldn't drink it because it's an analog of a neurotransmitter. And it's used as a, was used before it was outlawed by the FDA as a weight loss substance. So it increased your metabolism. Um, but it was also very dangerous because when you took these things as herbal supplements, the doses was not regulated and you could easily overdose on that. And just imagine overdosing on a neurotransmitter caused, it did cause some deaths um, in some cases. The ultimate weight loss medicine is when, you know, you're gone. Can't lose any more weight than that. So my, um, my Mormon story is about my early work back in the early 90s. I used to work in Hawaii. I worked on tropical plants, and I used to go out to Hawaii. And you know, Brigham Young University, the Mormons have been very active in the South Seas um, <coughs> promoting their religion. And so the Mormonism is spread throughout the uh, the South Seas, and they have a campus of Brigham Young University. The main campus is in Utah, but they have a campus on the island of Oahu, in the North Shore of Oahu, a beautiful area uh, of, the, of that island, and not a, well, not a really well-traveled area, especially in the early 90s. So I was looking for a place to stay out there while I was doing my research at a botanical garden out there, and I stayed at Brigham Young University. I stayed in their dorms. They would allow people to come out and do that um, for a very small amount in the summer when they didn't have other things going on. And I got up at that time. I don't drink coffee anymore. I drink decaf, but I don't drink caffeinated coffee. And that time I did drink coffee, I drank a good deal of it. I got up in the morning and went out to the, do to the um, cafeteria to get my breakfast and lots of, lots of nice spread out food for the students like we have here. Things went over to have my cup of coffee. No coffee because Joseph Smith and part of his revelation was that you shouldn't drink caffeine, so no coffee. Okay, I'll have some tea. No tea. Well, only herbal tea. So then, okay, I'll have a Coke. No Coke. No caffeine at all in the dormitory. So I had to go uh, find a cup of coffee someplace else. And so the Mormons, when they got out to the west of the United States and they couldn't drink coffee, they were observant, and most uh, Mormons are observant in this way. They, well, you know, it's just human nature. They found from the local, local Indians that there was this plant which would give them a little bit of a stimulant buzz, and that was ephedra. And so they brewed their tea out of that, and that became then why it's called Mormon tea. But there was no Mormon tea in the cafeteria of Brigham Young University also at that time. They got over uh, Mormon tea. After, there was a lot of things that happened in the early days of Mormonism that no longer happened. And probably a good things. And drinking unregulated doses of ephedrine is one of those good things. It doesn't happen anymore. So anyway, that's my Mormon tea story. So the moral of that story is if you're going to go stay in the dorms at Brigham Young, take your own caffeine. You're not going to get it from them. Photosynthetic stems. So these stems would be kind of green. Again, here are the male cones.
you can see there's got there's secondary growth. We're not going to talk about that very much in <coughs> this genera, genus, but when we get to the angiosperms, we'll talk about it again like we did in the conifers. Ephedra again, the photosynthetic stems. You can see the green color on here on the stems itself. These are again the male cones. And there are the microsporophores. <coughs> sticking out on the axles of the bracts. There's a bract, another bract. Here's a scale leaf. There's the scale leaf that the cone is in the axle of. So they're very small, not photosynthetic, and they mostly dry out at that stage. Here's another one. Here's a scale leaf, very small. <coughs> Same thing here. Here's the scale leaf. The cone is in the axle of that. The microsporophore, let me switch to white. sticking out. And if we looked inside those bracts, we would see something like this. So I'm going to switch back here to red. And the bract then, the subtending bract, would be like this. I'm going to draw that slightly different shape. <coughs> so that's the bract. on the main stem. It has been removed in this photograph, but that's where it would sit, out there. And then in the axle of that bract, there's two bracteoles and a microsporophore. I don't have a good way to write this, but I want to say here that these occur occur in the axle of the bract. Okay, so in the axle of that bract, that little unit occurs and it's got those two bracteoles. And bracteole just means a little bract. I-O-L-E is the dominion of ending. A bract is just a scale leaf, a scale leaf that occurs in a reproductive structure. So when it when the <coughs> scale leaf is born on the main stem, we call it a scale leaf. So when it's born in this reproductive unit, it's called bract. So our bracteoles then are just little bracts. Or I say I say a scale leaf here. I'm sorry. I, this is. What I said was right, what I pointed to was wrong. Let me go back one slide and make that clearer. When it's uh, here is a scale leaf that's born on the main stem. That is a scale leaf. Each of these things here, this is a bract. There is a bract. It is not born on the main stem, it is born on this strobilis axis. This bract, that is a bract, is born on the strobilis axis. And then the bracteole is born on the next higher axis. It's in the axle of the bract, and it's a little bract, just a small bract. OK, so my red bract is not drawn to scale. It's actually bigger than that, so it's a little bigger than the bracteole. So the important thing to remember there is bract, a reproductive, a leaf that's in a reproductive zone, often very highly modified leaf, and bracteole, a little bract. That's Let's diagram the structure that we've just drawn. I will draw the axis. This is the sporophore axis with our cluster of sporangia there. 
So that is the sporophore. On that sporophore, we have our two brachioles. And then below those two brachioles, on the axis of the stem, there would be the much larger bract. So the sporophore is in the axle of that bract, and the brachioles are born on that sporophore axis. <coughs> The other thing we could label here are the microsporangia. I need to draw for you the female side also, and maybe I need to do that on the blackboard because I don't have a space to do that, but I've drawn the structure of the male side we do need to draw the structure of the female strobilis. It's very, very similar. First, let's go on and do the <coughs> pollen tube and the po pollen grain. So here is the pollen tube growing out of the pollen grain. And of course, here's the germinated pollen grain. Here's our two sperm traveling down the pollen tube. This is on the female side. This is a egg. This is the egg here. You can see the nuclei in there. It's actually in the process of fertilization. And then outside of that, remember it's not quite as distinct here in, the, in this group. This is the archegonium. Again, very small surrounding the egg. And we're seeing the process of fertilization there. Now, in, the, in this group, the Nidophyta, we have a process that is called double fertilization. And this is a process that is shared by, with the angiosperms. In fact, it is a defining feature of the angiosperms. For many years, it was thought to be completely unique to the angiosperms but it's been discovered in the Nidophyta now, or perhaps confirmed in the Nidophyta. There were some reports of it from the uh, 19th century mm -hmm. in Nidophyta, and that's been confirmed in modern research now. So we see that taking place here. There's a sperm nucleus fusing with the egg, and there's another sperm nucleus here, and it's fusing with another cell, now called the ventral canal cell. We don't have to worry about what it's called here. Part to remember is that the sperm, all sperm nuclei are involved in a fusion product, involved in some kind of a fertil two fertilization process. <coughs> the only thing that's productive, that's going to result in a structure that's going to go on for the next generation, is the fusion with the egg, and that's going to form the embryo. The other fusion product disintegrates. It doesn't go on to contribute to anything. In the Nidophyta, in the angiosperms, we're going to get double fertilization. And in that case, it's going to go on and form something. In fact, it's going to form the nutrient of tissue. But we'll come back to that and do that again in detail. So here, again, two fertilization events. One, the normal one, forms the zygote. The other one, the sperm is used, it fuses with something, but then the product degenerates. It doesn't go on. But we still have double fertilization, and that is shared with the angiosperms. the next group that we're going to do. Here's the female cone, and maybe I can draw the structure of the female cone here on this. Here we have, get some white. There's our scale leaf. <coughs> There's a bract. There's an ovule up here at the top. 
And you see the same thing over here. Here's a BRAC, a BRAC. And up here, he's out of the picture, but there's the ovule. And the scale leaf, again, would be down here. So you can see in our female side, we've got, you know, bracts down here that do not seem to have ovules in them. They do not have ovules in them. So the structure of our cone, so here's our female cone axis. It occurs in the axle of a bract, or in the axle of a scale leaf. It bears a number of bracts, and these lower ones are sterile. They don't have anything in their axle. And then as you get toward the top, you find one or two of these bracts, and in there there is a axis, and on the tip of that axis there is an ovule. Okay, so it's all enclosed in those bracts. The bracts are bigger than I've drawn, but there is an ovule there. Now that ovule also has some bracteoles on it. That same axis has some bracteoles on it in most cases. And I'll draw those around here like I did. Yep, I'm really bad at drawing those. But these, I'm trying to show, and I am failing miserably at drawing those bracteoles, but there are bracteoles here, just like on the male side. Two bracteoles around that ovule on the axis. So the, the structure is analogous, it's just really exactly the same. It's just as the male side, it's just on the female side, we've got a bunch of sterile bracts, whereas on the male side, each of the, all those would have the sporophores in it. Now, we have a problem for my class because I told you something, my class, I told you something wrong in lab. It's not a big point, but this little axis here, what is that called? That is a little piece of stem and it is called the peduncle, the little foot. <coughs> and I think I told a lot, number of people in my class that we were calling that the sporophore. Technically, on the male side, we're calling it the sporophore. On this side, we're calling it the peduncle. If you get asked on this on an exam, we'll be flexible about this. Is, this I, the, I understand these structures are more confusing than a lot of the other th things we've done. And part of the reason that they're more confusing, well, it's a complex structure, but also because they just haven't been that much study of, this, of these organisms. Right? And so we're not, I'm not spending a lot, enough time on it to really go into detail about how all these bracts and things are and how we should get the terminology. And the terminology is not consistent across different books. So all of that is to say, we'll be flexible if we ask a question about what is an ovule born on a peduncle or a sporophore. Important thing to remember that in neither case do we have sporophylls. That's the easy thing and the important thing. So neither on the male nor the female side are there sporophylls. Things are born on, st on modified stems. The ovule or the sporophore are modified stems. And again, we know that because right, they come in the axle of a leaf and they bear leaves on them. Leaves don't bear leaves on them. We've got those bracteoles on these little stems, and so we know that they're stems. Here's the female side again. There's the sterile bracts. Here we have two ovules. You can see the two integuments, the outer integument and that inner integument sticking up out of it. And the same thing on our left side, we see the ovule, all the bracts. And down here, there's our scale leaf. The scale leaf is born on the main stem. On the right side, we have one ovule per 
female cone, and on the left side we have one. The structure of the ovule itself. First look at our two diagrams. This diagram here, enlarge that a bit, and you get what's on the right. I'm going to erase my red box because I'm going to color the things in now on the left diagram. We can start with the inner integument. <coughs> That come down. So eventually it merges with the other structures down here. But there's the inner integument. Outside that, oftentimes with a greeny, greenish color, but I've got it in blue here, here's our outer integument. I'm just going to color in the top part. At the bottom of the inner integument, we find the pollination chamber. where the pollen grain is going to come to lie, still going to be drawn into the ovule by the pollination drop. And then inside that, in this kind of orangey, you know, it looks kind of almost green on your screen, this color anyway, there is the megasporangium. Notice that at the top of the megasporangium, it actually doesn't close over the archegonium. It doesn't close over the female gametophyte. The pollination chamber is directly in contact with the female gametophyte. So the pollen grain, when it starts growing, doesn't have to grow down through the pollination chamber. It doesn't have to, I'm sorry, it doesn't have to grow down through the megasporangium. It just on the pollen, comes in the pollination chamber, lands on the megagametophyte, and can grow directly into the megagametophyte. This is associated with the fact that the time from pollination to fertilization in ephedra can be as low as 24 hours. So remember in the pines, it was over a year, 14 months in some cases, and here it's 24 hours. So a huge difference. I can't get much bigger a difference than that. And the structures reflect that. Inside, <coughs> we have the egg at the center of the megagametophyte, the eggs. I don't know what color I should do that. Whoops, that is not what I wanted. Just gonna use red again. There's the egg. And then this outside <coughs> is the megacommunified. The archegonium is not very distinct in these cases. We can kind of make it more distinct by drawing it in there. And this cell layer around the egg then would be considered the archegonium. <coughs> so 
So it's basically the same. The structure of the ovule is basically the same as we see in the conifera phyta. Here it is in section. Find the same pieces there. Now in this case, we've only got the one of the um, integuments shown. This is the inner integument. The outer integument has been removed in this case. PC is the pollination chamber. So that means just near that is we have the megasporangium. There is a little bit of tissue there, right at the tip, at the top of the megagametophyte. Let's see, what color did I make the megagametophyte? I've forgotten already. Green? How about highlighter? <coughs> Actually, the megagametophyte is bigger than that. It comes all the way out here. I'm probably highlighting the archegonium there. the center, we have, they've got it labeled archegonium here, but this is really the egg out there. And this area around the egg would be the archegonium. Same structures we saw in the other diagram, but now we just have in a section. So you can see the histology. Okay, so that's it for the Nidophyta. Let's take a break and go on. We'll come back with the angiosperms. <coughs>